Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we are talking about a new book, also just out as audio book, called We the Poisoned, Exposing the Flint Water Crisis, Cover-Up and the Poisoning of 100,000 Americans. Our guest is the author, Jordan Cheriton. The book, with a foreword by Aaron Brockovich, is devastating, and not just about one town in Michigan, but about the United States and beyond, and not just about something in the past, as this outrage is ongoing. Jordan Cheriton also has a YouTube channel called States Coup News. Uh, check it out. Jordan Cheriton, welcome to Talk World Radio. Thank you. And it's, uh, by the way, status coup. Ah, I said states. I can't read my own writing. Status <laughs> coup. It makes more sense. Uh, status coup news on YouTube. Uh, Jordan, for people who somehow managed to never know or have forgotten because the media moved on, uh, what happened and what has been happening in Flint, Michigan? So Flint, uh, at the turn of the century, uh, about 2010, 2011, into the second decade, um, it was kind of like a lot of these deindustrialized cities in America, really struggling. Uh, in the book, I kind of describe it as a rotting economic corpse. Um, and there was uh, some vultures that came in to try and make a quick buck off of a broke city. So basically, you had in 2011, uh, Republican Governor Rick Snyder uh, got elected, and he was a millionaire uh, computer executive who ran for governor on uh, running government like a business, which uh, we all know works pretty works out wonderful. Yeah. So um, because Flint was uh, struggling financially in a very controversial law, uh, he declared a financial emergency in Flint uh, and in other communities, Detroit, other cities, pre predominantly black cities. And he uh, appointed an unelected emergency manager, so kind of like a, a czar, to run the city. So voters' uh, votes were basically canceled because the unelected emergency manager uh, had more power than the elected mayor and city council. And the first order of business for this unelected emergency manager, who was basically just doing the bidding of the governor, so the governor essentially was the king uh, of Flint, was to try and privatize the water system. Um, water in Michigan, it's one of the Great Lakes states. The Great Lakes uh, provides 20% of the world's surface fresh water, some of the cleanest water in the world. Uh, and Flint had gotten its water for about 50 years from uh, the city of Detroit uh, through Lake Huron, which is one of the Great, Lake, Great Lakes. So Detroit sent water uphill to Flint uh, for 50 years without a quality problem. But uh, local officials uh, were complaining that Detroit kept raising Flint's water rates. So that was kind of the um, rationalization used. Let's just build our own water system so we could control the rates and, quote, save residents money. Sounds good. Uh, but the problem was they created a completely duplicative water pipeline, which in engineering terms is kind of unheard of. It ran along the same exact route. So identical pipeline as the existing pipeline uh, from Detroit to Flint. And at the last minute, Flint, uh, Detroit did not want to lose Flint as its biggest customer. So Detroit basically offered Flint nearly half off, uh, a half off discount for, to keep Flint. So there was really no reason uh, economically uh, to switch because Flint was going to save a whole lot of money by just continuing to receive water from Detroit. But it was never really about saving money. It was about creating a brand new water system, a privatized water system, where most of the water was actually going to be used for business, not residents to drink and bathe in. Uh, and this was going to be raw water uh, as opposed to treated water. And what do you need a lot of raw water for? Things like fracking, uh, the auto industry, farming. They called it the blue economy because they were uh, businesses were going to get cheaper water from this new water system. And essentially, while that new water system was being built, which was going to take two years, they decided, well, we'll just use the Flint River, which General Motors and Dow Chemical and DuPont and all these companies had dumped their waste in for a, a century, really. Uh, it was very polluted. If you talk to residents in Flint about the Flint River, you know, they would be horrified to know that 
that's what they were getting the water from. And in addition to using the polluted river, they decided we'll use the Flint water plant, which was essentially a, a skeleton. It had not been used for 50 years as a full-time water plant. Uh, I compare it to these Boeing planes that are falling apart midair. Uh, it did not even have most of the uh, equipment functioning or present when they switched. So you had this cascade of factors uh, between essentially a scam to build an unnecessary new water system and then a recklessness in the, in the short-term period while that new water system was being built to use a polluted river and a totally inadequate plant. And, and tragically, we, we know what happened. Layer upon layer of corruption and stupidity and people people suffered and, and are suffering and dying uh can you talk about some of the some of the people whose stories are in the book yeah and i just want to add by the way that on top of that corruption which i described flint was legally broke it, it was not bankrupt but it had no credit rating at this time so flint was not able to borrow any more money for anything really uh but to build this new water system, the emergency manager, the unelected emergency ma manager, uh, the governor's office, they needed Flint to be a city that helped finance this new water system. So how do you get a broke city to borrow $100 million? <laughs> they created a fake emergency that would allow Flint uh, to, to an exception to borrow this money. So that's part of this. There's a major financial fraud to allow Flint to basically shackle its residents with debt for 30 years to build an unnecessary new water system. But on to the health, uh, very quickly, uh, within two, three weeks, uh, brown water was coming into uh, residents' homes. Uh, children were sporting rashes all over their body. Uh, residents had hair falling out. Um, and you know, with heavy metal poisoning, lead, uh, and not just lead, but there was bacteria in the water, forever chemicals. You know, the, the manifestations of that don't always show up right away, particularly with lead. Uh, the health effects get worse as you go. So for some people, they got cancers, you know, a year or two later. For a lot of people, it happened five years later. Now, 10 years later, Flint is one of the worst cancer clusters in America. You have certain kinds of cancer, an NYU toxo toxicologist, her research shows certain types of cancer is up 300% compared to before the water switch. Uh, and it's not just cancers. I mean, my reporting, every time I've been there, you know, I, I remember in 2018, it was horrifying. I, I was knocking on doors for a story I was reporting in Flint. And almost every block I would go to, you know, I, if somebody opened the door, I'd ask, oh, you know, I'm noticing people aren't answering uh, a lot. And they would tell me about, you know, oh, that neighbor just died. Uh, and we're not talking about elderly people. We're talking about, you know, 40s, 50s, 60s, and all sorts of things, kidney problems, liver problems, rare cancer, you know, uh, you know, more common cancers. So this was a wrecking ball between the lead, the bacteria, the forever chemicals that was in that water. Um, it, it, it devastates your, you know, so many systems in your body. And that's just the physical we have, you know, then you have to get to the cognitive uh residents you know adults memory loss uh you know depression anxiety ptsd and then the children ma major increase in learning disabilities major regression in reading math you know the major categories of learning uh autism increased uh and then you know heavy metal poisoning research shows lead in particular really you know affects your mood so I've met so many people that go from zero to 60 very quickly, and that mood change then leads to higher crime. Uh, and now you have, the last time I was there, uh, horrifying and, and tragic, a lot of teenagers are now committing suicide in Flint, and they were children when they were poisoned. So between the physical symptoms, both the people that have already died, but the people that are kind of slowly dying, this, I don't even like using the word crisis. You know, it's called the Flint water crisis, but people have become really numb to that term. This is an active disaster. But unfortunately, uh, so many times with our media, after the inciting incident, in this case, you know, the river switch, long lines of people waiting for water, they kind of get bored or they want to move on to the next shiny thing. But the disaster is still going on. It's just, you know, they are not treating it that way. Yeah, it's not as uh, acceptable a story, perhaps, that the system 
didn't just fail in some crisis, but continues to fail year after year after year. And the book goes into not just name and names and who did this, but who lied about it, who covered up, who hid evidence, who destroyed evidence, who faked water quality tests and so forth. I mean, this was a endless saga. Can you talk a little bit about, about who did this and who's still doing it? Honestly, I don't even think the best screenwriter could come up with this. I really don't. I mean, I, I can't believe it, and I'm the one who got a lot of the information. Uh, this is the biggest government cover-up of the 21st century. Uh, frankly, I think it makes Watergate look like child's play. I mean, Watergate was just some knuckleheads that broke into an office. <laughs> if the president wasn't involved, I don't think anyone would care. I mean, I uncovered political payoffs where the governor's right-hand man kind of think like Tony Soprano's consigliere was going around Flint offering sick residents special deals, i.e. payoffs, to be quiet and not cause a stir with the media. Based on my reporting, the governor knew about it, that his right-hand man was going off trying to pay off residents. I found evidence that uh, the governor's top officials, as high as the head of the health department, erased their phones right before the launch of a criminal investigation. I mean, could you imagine if Trump and his people erased their phones like around the same time that COVID became a thing. Uh, I mean, Rachel Maddow and MSNBC would be calling for immediate impeachment, uh, among other things. Uh, but top officials, including his press secretary, environmental department officials, health officials, erased their phones. So there was no messages on them for the period that Flint was on the Flint River. Um, and, you know, I found evidence that one of his unelected emergency managers was shredding documents in his office the, on his final day uh, to the point where the criminal prosecutors got a search warrant that day and there was a big bag of just shredded documents. Uh, I got evidence of uh, his top officials tampering with witnesses, basically telling them, you know, getting them on script before they spoke with prosecutors. Uh, I got evidence that the governor himself was in a mad scramble, 22 phone calls over two days between the governor, his chief of staff and health director. Uh, to cover up the deadly Legionnaires outbreak. That was the waterborne bacteria that killed a lot of people. Um, I got his phone calls and, and other officials. I mean, things as sinister as like Flint residents sent a thousand water bottles to the governor with messages in them during this to get the governor to read and the governor demanding it be taken off the premises and literally some of his staff burning the water bottles and burn barrels. I mean, you can't just make this stuff up, but between payoffs, destruction of evidence, witness tampering, the governor's role, uh, top re Flint residents who were the most surveilled and monitored among the governor's office, mysteriously their car brakes being cut um, and them seeing punctures uh, and holes in their, in their brakes. And then when they looked on videotape, because uh, they were able to get it on camera that mysterious folks going under their cars <laughs> and then their auto break. I mean, just to me, you know, they always say like the cover up is worse than the crime. I think they're both pretty bad here, but the cover up is just staggering. And by the way, it's, it's not red and it's not red or blue. Both parties are in on this. So the Republicans presided over this, but the current governor of Michigan is a Democrat. The current attorney general of Michigan is cover up, uh, excuse me, is a Democrat. And the attorney general of Michigan, based on my reporting, is covering up today, 10 years later, the large financial fraud that caused all of this, I believe, to protect uh, both the state of Michigan as well as the Wall Street banks that were part of it. The same attorney general who's in the news right now for lying about Congresswoman Tlaib, uh, accusing her of, uh, of misactions uh, simply because of being Jewish, which Congresswoman Tlaib never said, ought to be in the news for uh, de derailing these investigations and replacing them with bogus minor, you know, replacing felonies with misdemeanors and so forth as documented in this book. I, I actually think the war on Vietnam was at the root of, of Watergate and this, the, the, the cover up is worse than the crime stuff is not really 
helpful. I think we should be glad people aren't saying the cover up is worse than poisoning people's water. And people sort of understand poisoning people's water is really, really bad, you know, but why why I say the cover up in this case is is equal is because they were covering it up in real time as people were being poisoned. So they kind of were intentionally poisoning people. I mean, if you know people's water are toxic and you're instead of ringing the bell and notifying them, but trying to hide it from going public, I mean, that is a deadly cover-up. Right. It's not like they were true believers in their business theory and the free market was going to save everyone. And then they found out later that people had been poisoned. They were poisoning people and and actively doing it and knowing it and, and lying about it. Um, what's been fixed now? How, is the water okay now? If you want to believe the state of Michigan and the EPA, it is. But if you want to actually go to Flint and report like I have, no, it's not OK. Uh, and just common sense, you don't need to be an expert. They have not replaced all the damaged infrastructure. So you can't keep very damaged pipes that deliver water in the ground, meaning they're all very corroded because you essentially had acid water going through the pipes. If you don't replace those pipes, it doesn't matter if the water is clean coming from the plant because it's traveling through pipes that are badly corroded. So lead and other things are going to leach off. So to this, I mean, I was just there a few weeks ago for my book. And at the event, there are residents coming up to me, showing me fresh rashes on their skin from the water. Uh, there are residents still losing hair when they shower. Uh, there are residents posting online brown water, videos of brown water. Is it as bad as it was in 2016? No, but there's still water contamination in different parts of the city. And then you get to a broader problem, which is not just unique to Flint. Flint's water system was built for the city when it had 200,000 residents. It now has 80,000 residents. So you have a water system that's too large. There are sections of Flint and Detroit and many other communities with abandoned homes where water is not being used. So in those parts of the water system, the water is stagnant. It's not moving fast enough. And when water is stagnant through the pipes, the chemicals like chlorine that are added to kill bacteria, they get soaked up too quickly. And that's how you get things like bacteria. So there's still been Legionnaires outbreaks in Flint that the media barely covers. Um, so there are residents today, uh, and I trust the residents. I don't trust the EPA or the state of Michigan, both, by the way, that I have caught, and it's in my book, cheating on water testing and manipulating data. Um, I don't trust them, I trust the residents. And I, you know, when I'm there, there are homes where you smell the, the water is funky. There are homes I've seen dirty water. And until they replace all of the pipes and not just the lead service lines, that's what the media has focused on. The service lines are the pipes that go from the curb, your curb into your home. But they haven't replaced the main pipes that run underneath the street. And they haven't replaced the interior pipes in your home. That's so if, if, if they're only replacing one out of three, you know, you're not. And by the way, they've preemptively in Michigan, while the governor was still there, Rick Snyder, he preemptively replaced all the lead pipes in Ann Arbor, which is wider and wealthier, when they didn't have a problem. So this is not just, it's a race issue, but it's also a class issue. If you're in, you know, a, the wrong zip code or city, uh, and it's happening in East Palestine, Ohio, too. Uh, Norfolk Southern blew up last year, five cars of highly toxic cancerous chemicals. The EPA is doing the same thing they did in Flint. They're cherry picking numbers, manipulating das data and saying everything's everything's fine. I, I got sick there. Residents are very sick that I'm speaking to. And uh, that is a poor white area. <laughs> so it seems to be if you don't have a lot of money or you're the wrong color uh, and you're in the wrong place at the wrong time, the government has this playbook where they're spending more time and money on PR and marketing to sweep it under the rug than actually fixing the problem. Amazing. Uh, we're speaking with Jordan Cheriton, and the book is called We the Poisoned, Exposing the Flint Water Crisis Cover-Up and the Poisoning of 100,000 Americans. Uh, PR, not a total success for Governor Snyder, who had presidential ambitions at the time, right? Yeah, that's part of this story. You know, I, I think it's hard for people to remember that time in a galaxy far before Trump. But around 2014, when Trump was not a thing yet, uh, presidentially, uh, you know, Republicans were 
going around kissing the ring of donors and angling to run for president in 2016. And Rick Snyder was one of them. And he wanted to run as kind of this economic wizard who, quote unquote, rescued uh, struggling cities like Detroit and Flint economically because he, he got Detroit out of bankruptcy, even though that was kind of a grift, too. And he wanted to claim, oh, look, we we're cutting Flint's deficit and saving Flint money with a new water system. So part of the cover up, I believe I, I can't get in his head. But he did want to run for president during this time. He was angling to run for president on the one year anniversary after the Flint switch. He was in Nevada at the Republican Jewish Coalition, kissing the ring of Sheldon Adelson while he was still alive. That was the uh, billionaire Republican casino guy. Um, so clearly not a good bumper sticker to run for president. I poisoned a city. So that was definitely part of the cover up. And in my book, I zero in on October 2014, which was kind of like ground zero for the cover up. That was six months after the water switch and basically two weeks before he was up for reelection. Obviously, he would he would have to win reelection as governor to have a chance to run for president. Uh, that's where we got phone calls showing the governor, his chief of staff, the health department director, all on the phone like 22 times in two days. And the prosecution mapped out their their normal call log over two years. And there really wasn't a lot of activity outside of those two days. And that period was the exact time that the environmental department, the health department were all f trading communications about this Legionnaire's disease. So based on my reporting, the governor knew about this deadly disease 16 months earlier than he notified the public. And based on my reporting, the original Flint prosecution team, this is part of why I say the current Democratic attorney general, either through incompetence or worse, has basically sabotaged justice for Flint because her predecessors, there was a special prosecutor, um, they were building a case against Snyder for involuntary manslaughter, which would have been the first time in history that I'm aware that a, that a sitting governor would be charged with involuntary manslaughter. And uh, she fired them when she got in. She fired the special prosecutor. She fired the chief investigator who used to run the Detroit FBI office. He helped bring down the Gambino crime family in New York, like pretty heavy hitter. She fired all them. She put in based on my reporting, kind of amateurs who happened to have donated to her campaign. Uh, the top prosecutor she put in had never even presented a uh, case before a jury. Uh, and they just tanked it. I mean, they dropped charges that it didn't make sense why they dropped the charges. Then they recharged with lesser crimes. They never followed through on the financial char uh, charges that the original team was building because they were going to build a case for RICO, which is uh, racketeering which is what they go after the mafia for uh, over the financial fraud that caused this. Mysteriously, that disappeared uh, when she took over. And today, why I say this is an ongoing cover up, uh, the Michigan Supreme Court threw out her her cases because uh, they said that the, the attorney general brought them in violation of the state constitution. So when that happened, they could no longer deny my freedom of information requests. Just they kept saying there's an active investigation. So the investigation was over, so I put in FOIA requests for documents that would outline the RICO case that was going to be brought. And that would have shown the evidence, who was going to be charged, I believe, the role of J.P. Morgan and Wells Fargo, Wall Street. First, her office told me they didn't have the documents, which I knew was a lie. Then I kind of publicly huffed and puffed that I was going to sue them. So in response, they kind of found Jesus and told me they would uh, they would look again, which never I've never come across that. Um, and then they magically found the documents, but they still won't give them to me, citing a bunch of legal nonsense. So today, as the media focuses on Trump and all the crimes, you know, uh, alleged crimes of him, to me, crime of the century, the poisoning of a community and, and it being buried is still being buried by the Democratic attorney general. Based on my sources and reporting, I don't think she wants those documents out there because there is still chances if this financial fraud was brought, uh, exposed, there is still a chance of criminal prosecution over that. Everything else is kind of outside of the statute of limitations. But if the financial fraud was brought forward, the federal statute on RICO is a lot more flexible than the state of Michigan. 
And I don't think they want to go down that uh, avenue because basically what you have here is bond fraud. Uh, you had an unnecessary new water system and the bonds to finance that system were fraudulent. So you could have a whole lot of investors suing the state of Michigan because the attorney general's office is the one who signed off on this fraudulent deal. And you could also have um, Wall Street banks, JP Morgan and Wells Fargo, could be facing hundreds of millions of dollars in liability over their role. And we know that both parties tend to protect Wall Street banks. Uh, no kidding. The, the, the Democrats jumping into this sort of Gerald Ford role on this thing was foreshadowed a bit by then President Obama showing up and drinking the water, not burning it, drinking it and saying it was pretty good, right? Yeah. You know, I wish I was there that day because uh, that to me was just dumbfounding for a lot of reasons. I can't get in Obama's head, um, but to condescend sick people uh, primarily, you know, majority black city, um, first black president, and to basically like say, well, I, I, you know, I sniffed a lot of lead when I was a kid and I'm fine. It's arguable whether he even drank Flint water. Michael Moore swears that it was from Air Force One. I'm not sure. But um, Obama, you know, I think Obama was a creature of meritocracy and kind of academia. I think he wrongly trusted uh, the EPA that was serving him, that the situation was getting better. Uh, frankly, I don't really think it was his priority um, what happened in Flint. I think he went there, checked the box, you know, drank the water, but I don't really think he, not to say he didn't care, but I, I don't think it was a top priority. I think he had other priorities. And um, it, it it is devastating because that drink of water has given so many, you know, lizard brain liberals, <laughs> I would say, um, this kind of uh, notion that, oh, it's, Everything's better, Jordan. Stop being dramatic. Obama's Congress gave Flint $170 million, which in the book I expose very little of that actually got to Flint for water relief. But yeah, Obama going there, um, although he wasn't pres directly presiding over the cover-up, he certainly was complicit through inaction. And his EPA was even more complicit because they knew that the water was bad a year and a half before it went public. And instead of stepping in as the federal government, when you see that the state, the state of Michigan, it was not some mistake. They were breaking laws. The environmental department broke the law. You're, by law, they were supposed to add corrosion control chemicals into the water. They right. didn't. Uh, they knew, the EPA knew they were manipulating data. But instead of stepping in, it was neoliberalism on steroids. And the EPA said, well, let's, Let's get a judge's opinion if we could step in. I mean, what is the point of having a federal government if people are being poisoned and you're not going to step in to stop it? Good, good question. I, I want to, we're running out of time. I wish we could go for hours on this. I recommend that everybody read the book, but I just want to close with this little quote from the foreword by Aaron Brockovich. Nearly half the tap water in the U.S. is contaminated with cancer-causing forever chemicals. According to a 2021 U.S. Geological Survey, over 10 million lead pipes are still beneath us. Many are nearly a century old, delivering drinking water to our taps, and that's likely an undercount. So Flint is the, is the tip of an iceberg. This is not isolated to Flint, Michigan, uh, and we ought to pay attention to what's happening there. The book is called We the Poisoned, Exposing the Flint Water Crisis Cover-Up and the Poisoning of 100,000 Americans by our guest, Jordan Cheriton. Jordan, thanks for all you've been doing for, for years reporting on this uh, and for writing this book and for coming on Talk World Radio. Thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.